Hi, and welcome to our first ANSYS Virtual Academy session. You might be familiar with our other AVAs. That's the Autodesk Virtual Academy, where they cover computer-aided design programs for the Autodesk product. For these AVAs, we'll be covering CAE, computer-aided engineering. Simulation is one of those type of CAE tools. And for the ANSYS Virtual Academy, we'll be covering the ANSYS product. We'll be covering simulation training and ANSYS product information, ANSYS is and what it can do for you. I'm John Dow, I'm your host, uh, Applications Engineer at Kativ Technologies. I specialize in the structures mechanical area of the ANSYS tools. And we just wanna share the knowledge of ANSYS with you. We wanna help train you and get you uh, proficient with the software. For today's AVA, we'll be covering CFD and how to do it in the ANSYS program called Fluent. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce you today with our, our demonstrator, Snigda Sarkar. Hi everyone, I'm Snigda Sarkar, uh, application engineer here at Kativ Technologies. I specialize in CFD. Uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit about my past experience. I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Cincinnati. Um, I specialized in CFD. Previously, I have worked as an underhood thermal engineer at Caterpillar. And even before that, I used to work as a research assistant for GE Aviation, specializing in lubricant cavitation. Um, I have over six years of experience in using ANSYS products for my CFD simulations. And today I will be hosting this webinar, um, giving you an overview of CFD basics. Even before um, I can jump into the technical part of the presentation, uh, let me speak to you a little bit about Kativ. Um, we here at Kativ, we are a technology company that started off as an Autodesk reseller. We have since expanded to provide simulation and consultancy solutions for our customers. Um, our goal is to empower today's innovators and manufacturers for a better tomorrow. And keeping that goal in mind, we have become more customer centric in not only providing them with a simulation product, but also ensuring that they're competitive and successful through our guidance, technology, and support. Kativ is an official ANSYS channel partner, and in case you're not familiar with ANSYS, um, ANSYS is the global leader in engineering simulation. ANSYS's mission, much like Kativ's, is to empower customers to design and deliver transformational products through pervasive simulation. Um, the ANSYS Virtual Academy is a step forward in meeting our customers' goals. Kativ, as you know, is already the best in class provider for virtual academies, especially on the Autodesk side. We are now extending that brand to cover simulation as well. Uh, ANSYS Virtual Academy will occur every other Tuesday at 10 a.m. PST. And uh, I just want to make sure that all of uh, our subscribers know that you will receive your notifications for each of these sessions so that you have the flexibility to pick and choose which sessions to attend in case you're interested in a topic but cannot uh, attend it real time. Then you always have the option of um, watching the recorded session on our YouTube channel later on. These sessions are going to be interactive in sense that you can ask us questions. Uh, pertaining to that seminar. And I will get to those questions towards the end of the webinar, or if I run out of time, then I'll make sure I get back to you personally and answer your question. So let's start with the agenda for today's session. Uh, firstly, I will be covering an overview of the CFT basics. What is CFT? Why do we need CFT? What can you stand to gain uh, by switching to simulation instead of relying on age-old techniques of experimentation and testing? Secondly, I will be introducing the ANSYS Fluent graphical user interface uh, to our uh, audience, especially the ones who are not familiar with the platform. I will be going over the workspace to see um, how you can navigate the different options you have to set up your CFT simulation. Lastly, I will be doing a short demonstration of a classic CFD example, which shows the flow over a cylinder. And this will be a little bit more uh, informative in terms of selecting uh, your uh, solution setup to 
uh, complete a CFD simulation in Fluent. So let's get started. What is CFD and why do we need CFD? That is the main question, right? So CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics. It is the science of computing flow variables over the entire flow domain. So uh, why do we need CFD? Well, sometimes when you're solving simulations or when you're solving flow problems, it's easy for you to do hand calculations and find out the quantities of interest. For example, if you're doing a pipe flow simulation, you might be able to uh, calculate the friction losses. But in complex flows, it's not easy for you to analytically solve the governing equations. That's where CFD comes in because CFD can solve these governing equations over the domain in a numerical fashion, giving us a comprehensive range of engineering data that can really help us design our tools, design our products better, uh, more efficiently. CFT is less expensive, less time consuming than physical testing and prototyping. If you conduct a physical test, at the most you can get your engineering data at one or two gauge locations. CFT on the other hand will let you find your flow variables, your temperature, pressure, velocity, wherever you want over the entire domain. It can also help you with design optimization, with parametric study. You can isolate your physics, simulate what if scenarios, understand the effect of varying a parameter on the overall results. Overall, CFT is a really powerful design tool that can be used for improving your product development workflow and ultimately result in cost and time efficiency. So Sneda, would you say CFD is a tool that we would pervasively? Yes, yes. And depending on your application, uh, you know, you can complicate it or simplify it as per your need. So you can simplify certain applications if you are interested in solution or if you're interested in variables that do not require complicated physics. On the other hand, if there is something, uh, if there is an application in which you need um, to include all the flow physics for the sake of accuracy, for the sake of research and development, CFD also allows you to do that. So you can really uh, you know, expand over the entire range, the length and breadth of flow simulations, whether it is internal flow, external flow, and use CFD as an important, uh, powerful tool to get your answers. Awesome. So this slide basically talks about some of the predominant CFD applications that you see in the industry nowadays. Uh, some of you might be already familiar with it. Some of you might be uh, new to CFD. So I'm just gonna talk about a few of these. Uh, of course, there are a lot of CFD applications, so it won't be possible to go over every one of them. But um, specific to Kativ, for example, let's say we have a lot of pump customers. They are looking to improve their pump efficiency. They are looking to find the pressure rise. They're looking to see if, um, phenomena like cavitation and erosion have a damaging effect on the pump surfaces. For all these different CFD applications, uh, you can you know, simulate the flow uh, on a computer using a simulation model and get your answers instead of having to do physical testing or prototyping. Uh, you can do fluid structure interaction wherein you couple uh, fluid flow solution with structural analysis. For example, you can study fan degradation, blade degradation, uh, you can do thermal analysis uh, for battery systems. You can find the heat transfer coefficient for heat exchangers. You can find the temperature contours for electronic cooling. Really, there is no limit to the amount of data, amount of engineering solution you can get from um, switching to CFD uh, instead of using your traditional methods of uh, studying flow in different components or machines. So let's go over the basics of CFT in terms of how it works, right? I already talked about how CFT takes your governing equations and by governing equations, I mean your mass continuity and your con uh, momentum continuity equations and it solves them numerically. The momentum conservation equations, uh, as some of you might know, are more uh, uh, commonly known as the Navier-Stokes equations. These are, um, 
highly coupled nonlinear partial differential equations. You cannot solve them analytically. They cannot be solved. You cannot find an exact solution for them. So what does CFD do? How does it uh, help us in that case? What CFD does is uh, it'll divide your computational domain into smaller elements. In the case of ANSYS Fluent, uh, it uses a finite volume method, which basically divides your domain into these small cells or control volumes. Now, the conservation equations, the governing equations, they are discretized into a system of algebraic equations that can be solved at these cell centers. So they are no longer the um, coupled nonlinear partial differential equations anymore. So these discretized algebraic equations can be easily solved throughout the domain. And you can find the flow variables at the cell center uh, for each of these individual control volumes. If you want to include additional physics, say heat transfer, turbulence, et cetera, then you will have additional transport equations that are solved with the basic um, continuity and momentum equations to give you your flow variables in the entire domain. Um, you can see on the right that this is a standard common generic equation that shows um, a scalar field phi. And this value can be varied uh, to uh, transform this equation into continuity or the momentum equations or even energy. This is a general form of the equation. We will be having a future session uh, on solver theory where we will be talking into detail uh, of how ANSYS Fluent um, uses these equations to get uh, its flow variables at the cell centers. So we can discuss it in depth at that time. So let's talk about the general CFD workflow. How would you go about uh, finishing or setting up your simulation? The first step is to define your problem. You have to understand your CFD deliverables. What are you looking for? Pressure, velocity, temperature, forces. You need to identify that. You also need to understand what level of accuracy or cost uh, you're willing to spend on your simulation. Uh, can you leverage a little bit of accuracy if you can get the computation to finish earlier? Uh, so these are some of the things that you need to consider even before you start setting up your simulation. The second step is pre-processing. Identify your CFD domain, whether it is internal flow, external flow. See if you can simplify it. Can it be made into uh, you know, a 2D flow? Uh, anything to reduce the computational resources that you need uh, to finish the simulation. You'll obviously have to either create or clean up your CAD model. So for example, in the picture here, you see a pipe, uh, the internal flow volume has been extracted um, on the right over here. And the next stage is um, to perform the meshing. This meshing uh, I've mentioned is need-based, depends on what regions you're focusing on. If you're trying to capture high gradients, if you're trying to um, capture uh, physics or flow phenomena, then you need to uh, refine the mesh in that particular region, but you also need to strike a balance between um, cost and accuracy, more the number of cells in your domain, uh, more the memory that you require uh, to read the mesh, and of course to solve the simulation. In solver setup, you'll basically set up your simulation. You'll select your material, your properties, set up the boundary conditions, initial conditions, uh, choose the method of discretization, the pressure velocity coupling, and eventually set up your convergence or flow monitors. And I'll be talking a little bit more about convergence uh, when I uh, show the demo later on. Uh, the flow monitors are basically your quantities of interest for which you're running your simulation. Um, since these simulations are iterative in nature, you want your monitors to steady out before uh, you stop the solution. And lastly, you will do the post-processing part wherein you'll examine your solution for results. You might be interested in pressure, velocity, uh, fluent, uh, and other ANSYS tools give you a very good opportunity for uh, post-processing visualization. As you can see, I use the same model to uh, extract the CAD, uh, perform the meshing, and then get the solution uh, for a simple pipe flow. Sometimes you might need to go back to the solver or the pre-processing stage after post-processing. If the results don't look intuitive, you might want to change your simulation setup. You might also want to do a design or parametric study, in which case, again, you will be varying the parameters. So with that said, um, we will start talking about the ANSYS Fluent GUI or the graphical user interface. 
But before I do that, um, I would like to talk a little bit about ANSYS Fluent in general. Um, and right about now, I'll also launch a poll so that, again, I can ascertain how experienced are you with Fluent? Uh, if you are a beginner, intermediate, or an expert user, um, it'll help uh, me in assessing uh, how I should tailor my sessions in the future. So I'll keep that on for a little while. And let's start talking about ANSYS Fluent. Now, ANSYS Fluent, as some of you might know, is one of the most popular, widely known CFT solvers available commercially. It is robust. It is accurate. Uh, it has been intensely verified and validated uh, using benchmark experimental and analytical solutions in the literature. Uh, that is one of the main reasons why ANSYS Fluent is so popular. It has been around for ages. Uh, we have perfected uh, the simulation strategy, uh, especially when you talk about complex physics, because ANSYS Fluent is a very powerful solver, and it lets you incorporate so many different physics. You can solve for non-Newtonian flows, transient flows, reacting flows. Uh, you can solve for turbulence. Uh, what you can also do is a multi-physics coupling, um, over right, on the right over here, you can see how um, solution from a structural analysis has been passed on to ANSYS Fluent. And then there is a two-way coupling uh, of the system, which it basically means that you're um, transferring structural analysis data to your Fluent simulation and vice versa. On the right over here, you can see a quick example uh, wherein we are doing a blade flutter analysis, wherein your blade is degrading because of aerodynamics, and this eventually has an impact on the aerodynamics of the flow as well. So this is fully integrated with ANSYS work Workbench, which is ANSYS's project management tool. And with ANSYS Fluent, it's very easy to uh, do such multi-physics simulations. And Sengo, this is one of the strong suites of, uh, of ANSYS, correct? It's, a, it's the multi-physics capability, right? Absolutely, absolutely. This is one of the USPs of uh, using ANSYS Fluent uh, and why it has been termed as, you know, one of the best CFD solvers available commercially. Um, yeah, we, and we, yeah, and some of the ANSYS competitors might advertise that ANSYS uh, or, you know, their simulation tools can do multiple physics. But when, you know, when ANSYS talks about multi-physics, type of coupling here where you know you could pass these results over from one type of uh, physics to another you know your pressure contours will be carrying over to your your solids so you when you're doing your finite element analysis you know that's something that a lot of other simulation tools cannot and you know exactly. that's that's the strong point of answers exactly exactly absolutely couldn't agree more um, and ANSYS Fluent, even in general, coming to my next point, is one of the most intuitive and user-friendly tools. Uh, you have a single window workflow right from CAD import to post-processing. You can use uh, Fluent Meshing, uh, which has guided workflows for both watertight and dirty geometry. And you can just simply go step by step and get a fully automated mesh uh, generated, which is highly accurate and also you know, uses the least amount of cells. And that I think um, is a huge advantage, especially for new beginners who you know, struggle with best practices for meshing. Um, and I myself have uh, you know, used it extensively uh, to reduce my computational time. And in a future session, we will be talking about these um, uh, guided workflows for meshing and fluent um, in detail. Hey, um, so we had a question. What, someone's asking, what, is, what does watertight geometry mean? Watertight geometry basically means a geometry in which the CAD has already been cleaned up, so there aren't any gaps. You have a completely enclosed flow domain. Um, it could either be an external flow or internal flow. Basically, the flow is not leaking. So if, for example, you take um, a pipe, uh, you know, like, for example, when I used to work at Caterpillar, we would get a lot of... Um, pipe and tube designs from the design team, but, you know, they would have flanges and, you know, they wouldn't exactly um, 
be overlapping. So sometimes there would be gaps that we would have to, you know, um, then cover. So ANSYS Fluent can handle uh, dirty geometries in which, you know, those gaps have not been covered. And it can also um, handle the watertight geometries, of course, you know, wherein you already have the fluid domain extracted and you just go ahead and mesh it. So both those workflows are available in Fluent. If there are gaps in the geometry, then ANSYS basically uses a wrapping technology where, you know, you have some sort of a, almost like a, you know, shrink wrap technology. You just, you know, uh, mesh the entire domain and cover all those gaps. So you don't have to do it manually. And that's the advantage. These are, these are going to be feature AVAs that you'll be covering also, right? Exactly. Yes. I will be yeah. doing demos of, you know, uh, following these workflows in detail. And that I think will be hugely beneficial for new CFD users. Yeah. And we, uh, had, one, we had one customer asking about the, the, the workflow that we see up in the upper uh, what what are we seeing here? What is he seeing here when he sees the transient uh, being coupled over to fluent, and then uh, and then for this uh, for this snippet over here. Yeah, yeah. He just wants to understand the the connections from A B. Yeah. So it, right. this is just a two way coupling FSI, wherein you know you have your <clears throat> when wherein you have your solution data being transferred uh, from you know your structural analysis to your um, you know system coupling, and right. then. Um, back to your results. So you, if you look at the connections over here, so you have your solution going to your results over here, and then you have your solution going to your results over here. So basically what you're doing is uh, you're not just saying that your structural analysis impacts your fluid flow. You're saying that your fluid flow also in turn impacts your structural analysis. So for example, like I said, for this blade flutter analysis, and this is not the same, uh, simulation, these are two different snippets. Mm. But even in the blade flutter analysis, initially you'll have some sort of blade degradation because of your flow pressures being, uh, you know, impacting the structural integrity over time. Now, after that blade has degraded, what impact does it have on the aerodynamics of the flow? So it, it's, it's a two-way coupling. You could also do one-way coupling where you just see the effect of one, um, uh, for example, you just look at the effect of flow on the structural integrity, but do not map it back. So these are just like, you know, one way, two way coupling examples um, uh, that, you know, you can do with ANSYS Fluent uh, to solve complex physics and get the most accurate R&D solutions. And correct me if I'm wrong, Sunita, but, you know, I'm, I'm a structures guy and, and, you know, you're a CFD specialist, but in, in most cases when we're doing the analysis, it's assuming that the walls that we're interacting with are not moving, right? So if, if, I, if, I, if I found that there are some, uh, some reactions in my solid geometry mm. that are deflecting and moving, if I pass those results all fluent, uh, it can, you know, t based off of the results that I'm getting from my FEA, that can transfer over to CFD, correct? Right, yes, you can, yeah. yeah. So you can do it both ways and do a coupled analysis, which is what, you know, this uh, mm. workflow is showing when you have your system coupling. Okay, I think we answered that question, thank you. Uh, yeah. And then there's just one more question. Uh, does Fluent couple with Maxwell? Yes. All right. And that's something that we could probably cover in more detail in another yes. ABA, or we'll get back to yeah, we'll yeah. Get back to yeah. So we have planned like, you know, all these sessions and uh, I think uh, uh, JD, uh, so uh, John will also cover some of these multi-physics uh, sessions in later ABA sessions. So if that is something that you'd be interested in, be sure uh, to be subscribed because we will be uh, talking about that in depth uh, in the later sessions. So with that, let's just uh, switch over to the ANSYS Fluent GUI. Just give me one second. Let me end this polling over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you um, the workbench window and I'm going to launch a Fluent session to go over the graphical user interface. So right now, can you guys see my screen, JD? Yes. Okay, all, all right. right. We can do the workbench. Yeah, got it. So I'm just going to launch Fluent over here. And 
keep in mind, uh, I just want to, you know, like uh, reiterate this point. There are, there are a lot of things that we're discussing in today's uh, session uh, in a very generalized manner. That's because this is the very first ANSYS Virtual Academy session and we uh, wanted to, you know, um, talk about simulation in general and CFD in general. But uh, everything that we are showing right now, like even the workbench uh, workspace and uh, Fluent in general, we will be talking about this in detail in future ABA sessions. So we will be doing individual simulation cases wherein we go over the details of what we're choosing, why we're choosing, why is this option more accurate than something else. So it'll get a little bit more specific, a little bit more physics and application oriented um, towards the latter part of the series. But right now we're just starting off um, with the basics. So I trust that you guys can see my Fluent workspace over here. This is ANSYS Fluent 2020 R1, in case somebody was curious about the version. Um, I already have a mesh loaded over here, and this is for the demo that I will be doing. Uh, but let's not talk about that yet. Let's just go over the workspace, because I want to show you how to navigate this window if you're not familiar with the platform, right? So when I open Fluent, you have few major sections that you need to focus on. Let's start from the very top. This is called the ribbons tab. If you go- Hey, um, hey Snake, I, I think we're looking at the workbench still. Okay. Green. Thank yeah, you for yeah. pointing that out. Okay. Can you see the Fluent now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're looking at the Fluent GUI. Yeah, it just opened okay. up right now. Yeah, I was sharing my workbench. I automatically thought, you know, that my fluent no will be shared, but yeah, okay. All right. Uh, first time glitches. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So this is ANSYS Fluent. And um, like I said, I'm just going to be talking about how to navigate the uh, graphical user interface to set up your basic simulation. I already have a mesh loaded over here, which um, I'll talk about more for my demo. But right now, I'll just go over the individual sections uh, that you might use for setting up your simulation. So we'll start from the very top. This is the ribbons tab. If you go from left to right, you'll see domain, physics, user-defined solution, etc. So the idea is that when a user launches Fluent, um, they go from left to right, okay, while setting up the simulation. So you start with the domain first, your computational domain. Right. And you'll see some of the options here. They seem very intuitive. So you start with the mesh. For example, you loaded a mesh. Now you want to check um, if that mesh is working fine. You want to check the quality of that mesh. Right. So you just click on quality. You evaluate mesh quality. So anything to do with your computational domain will be under this tab. After you have your computational domain all set up, you want to understand, hey, what kind of physics do I want to include in my simulation? Do I want it to be laminar flow? Do I want it to be turbulent flow? Am I doing a single phase flow? Am I doing a multi-phase flow? So anything that deals with the physics that you're including in your CFD, that'll be under the physics tab. Then uh, so on and so forth. You keep moving from left to right. You have some user-defined expressions that you can set up. Um, you can vary your solution parameters, your solution methods, your discretization schemes. And after you're done solving, you can move on to the results tab to get your post-processing results. This one is not solved yet, so a lot of it is grayed out. But you get the idea of how Fluent would expect uh, a new user to proceed. Similar to the ribbons tab, you have your outline view on the left. Now, I personally prefer the outline view over the ribbons tab. They essentially do the same thing. Uh, the difference is that in the outline view or the tree structure, as you may call it, you go from top to bottom. And again, this is very you know, self-explanatory. You can start with the setup of the solution, then move on to the solution, and then move on to the results. So remember in that slide when I talked about the general steps in a CFD workflow, and I talked about setting up your CFD simulation? Well, all that would be done in the setup section. So you have individual sections over here, and if you double click on them, you'll have either dialog boxes or you'll have other options open up adjacent. This adjacent region is called the task page. 
and when I'm doing my demo, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about the individual options that you have under each of these settings. But basically, like here in the ribbons tab, you had physics. Here in the outline view, you have models. You can also play around with your materials. You can set your cell zone conditions, cell zone conditions as in your computational domain, whether it's a fluid, whether it's a solid, what material does it have? Like for example, this is under cell zone conditions. If I double click on this, I can change um, the settings over here. I can change the material, depending on what kind of flow physics you're including, you might have some of these tabs available to you. You then move on to boundary conditions. Uh, in this mesh, I have already assigned the boundary names. So you see inlet, outlet, wall, et cetera, already mentioned, but you'll need to do that in the meshing stage. And uh, you can right click on them, change their type, assign a boundary condition, and so on and so forth. So this basically shows you how to set up your CFD simulation. You can then move on to the solution tab. Now, what does the solution tab do? It helps you choose the methods for solving your flow. So if I double click on methods, it'll show you what kind of schemes are you using for pressure velocity coupling. Remember, CFD is an iterative method. You have different uh, pressure velocity coupling options available to you. You can use a coupled solver, you can use a segregated solver. And similarly for discretization, you can use different schemes. Depending on what kind of accuracy you want, you can choose first order, second order, so on and so forth. In the solution tabs, you also have something called the monitors. If you expand monitors over here, you'll see residuals. Residuals are basically um, your indicators of convergence. Uh, you can see that in this case, the K omega turbulence model is turned on by default. Um, in the 2020 R1 fluent, uh, the turbulence model is turned on by default because it assumes that most of the real world applications are turbulent. But uh, for this simulation, I'll be turning it off later. So whatever transport equations along with the basic flow equations you're solving, that'll be available for you in, these residual, in this residual monitors dialog box. You can of course change the convergence criteria. Usually we use 1E minus six uh, for most CFD applications. And then you have your initialization option. You can choose between standard or hybrid initialization. Again, it's an iterative process, so you need to start somewhere. You can either um, initialize with set values yourself or the solver can calculate that for you using hybrid initialization. After you run your calculation, um, so I'm not gonna go into the run calculation part just yet. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the demo. But after you're done uh, calculating and your solution convergence, your residuals and your flow monitors steady out, that's when you go to the results section. And here you can do all sorts of post-processing. Your graphics, your plots, your reports, your animations, everything is available to you over here. So these two are the basic, you know, um, sections that you will use to navigate um, your setup for your CFD simulation. Whatever results, whatever um, graphics you are going to see, be it the mesh, be it the solution, is going to be uh, displayed in the graphics window over here. The graphics window um, can uh, be modified using this toolbar over here. For example, if I want this to fit the screen, I can just hit fit to window. And again, very user friendly because if you hover over these icons, it tells you what it does. So it's very, it's very simple. Uh, Fluent was you know, one of the first CFD solvers that I used as a student. And um, you know, at that time, we didn't have a lot of resources available to us, but I was still able to pick it up. So from personal experience, I can vouch for the usability and ease uh, of using Fluent to set up your CFDs simulations. This part right here is called a console. It's basically used for input and output in text format. If the solver wants to tell you something, for example, you did a mesh check and your mesh failed, that'll be displayed over here. If you want to uh, give a text command to Fluent, then you would type it over here. 
We will cover TOIs in a separate section, so I won't talk in details about that. But sometimes, you know, um, your commands are not automatically visible as icons over here, so you might want to type it in. So you can do that using the console over here. Um, here you have your search bar. Uh, you can search for commands or, so for example, if I write solve over here, um, it'll show you where exactly um, can you find options or icons related to solve. Or it can also give you suggestions on text commands um, that are related to solve. So this is just a general um, field in which you can type in a keyword and whatever options Fluent has to offer related to that keyword, it'll show up. So that is that. Um, let's start with the, yes, JD, go ahead. Hey, oh yeah, Signa, I just wanted to mention something that I really like about uh, the ANSYS user interface. Uh, I, if we highlight any of these features here, when we hit F1 on your keyboard, I believe it, it, it'll help menu, right? Uh, yeah, take exactly. A, yeah, can we, can we see that real quick? I, I think that's something really valuable that a lot of uh, other you know, user interfaces don't, uh, don't do good enough. I, you know, just having this, hitting the F1 keyboard on your yeah. keyboard and just you, pulling up a help. You can, you know, you can hit F1 or you can just, you know, um, access this question mark over here. It automatically gives you, I'm not going to click on it because it'll take sure. me to another window that I yeah, will again no have problem. to switch to, but you can, you know, access the user guide. Um, you can access all the online documentation uh, that ANSYS has to offer. And believe me, that documentation is one of the best, uh, you know, solver documentations available, commercially speaking, because I've tried to look up documentation on other solvers and it's never clear it's never um, you know um, well organized well organized exactly so um, yeah this is really helpful and you know thank you for reminding me um, but yeah so you can definitely access all the documentation the user guide the theory guide uh, through this tab over here so let's just uh, go over the demo and it'll be a little bit more clear as to how to navigate these different uh, task bars to set up our simulation. So let me show this. So for today's demo, I chose flow over a cylinder. And the reason, sorry, the reason why I chose, okay, what did I do? The reason why I chose flow over a cylinder is because these, this is one of those classic cases that we simulate in grad school. Um, basically, this is a transient flow phenomena, more commonly known as the von Karman effect. Um, you can so see the flow uh, over a cylinder and how it um, uh, has these vortices forming in the wake region of the flow. And this is something that we're going to set up in today's uh, demonstration. Uh, this is something that is extensively studied in the literature. So if you're just starting off with CFD, you could try this case and then match your computational results with your literature results. And that'll be, you know, some sort of a personal proof of concept for how accurate uh, your solutions can be when you're using the ANSYS Fluent Solver. So if you are a CFD beginner or if you are a Fluent beginner and, you know, you want to test out its capabilities, um, I think this is a very good case uh, to start off with. So let's go ahead and... Yeah, if you ask me, Snig, uh, you know, someone that, that's not familiar with computational fluid dynamics, and if, if you asked me to draw the flow lines for something like that, I probably just drew, uh, you know, the way that it looks like in the beginning. I, th I think it's really interesting how, you know, that sinusoidal wave kind of forms in the end. Um, you know, that's something that I, I couldn't imagine just from the knowledge I... I I, I had coming out of undergraduate. So I think that's fantastic demonstration right. that you're going to be going through. If like, if you look at it, you know, you'll feel, um, okay, you know, this looks a bit complex, but actually it's not complex at all. Um, and um, can you see my fluent now? Yeah. Okay. It's not complex at all. You know, it's a simple simulation, which uh, displays the unsteady behavior uh, of, you know, vortex shedding uh, in the wake region of a simple flow over a cylinder. And this is not even turbulent, right? This is just a, a laminar flow operating in the Reynolds number range of 80 to 100. And you'll see how a little bit of, uh, you know, perturbation grows out to be a sinusoidal uh, nature. 
in terms of the lift and drag coefficients um, for this particular kind of flow. So let me start. This is the mesh that I have uh, for a flow over a cylinder. This is a 2D mesh. Um, uh, like I said, you know, you can always simplify your cases. If, for example, your flow is not varying in one particular direction, then you can always uh, simplify your computational domain into a 2D planar mesh so that you reduce um, on the uh, mesh count. What I have here is a cylinder boundary. Uh, the external uh, environment of the cylinder is simulated. So what you can see is uh, basically um, a near wall refinement of the mesh, wherein we are uh, expecting the most gradients in terms of the uh, flow separation. And then this gradually grows out. We call this like inflation layer. This gradually, uh, we have a growth rate assigned to the mesh. And we will be talking about mesh uh, in more detail in future sessions. This basically grows out and- And you're, and you're doing, right? Just I'm sorry, that. JD, your voice broke off. Oh, I was saying, and you're, and you're doing this inflation layer for accuracy as well, right? Yes, because anytime you want to capture the flow physics uh, or you, know, you want to refine your mesh enough so that you're not missing out on any length or time scales. So ideally, you know, there are other ways to make this mesh as well. For example, because this entire region will be your wake region, you might want to consider refining here as well. But in the interest of saving time right now, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, refining uh, around the surrounding of the cylinder. But uh, like you will see, and like you saw in the video, there might be um, vortices in this region. So you might wanna consider refining this region as well, the wake region. So there are multiple ways of, you know, uh, using a mesh to get your CFD simulation. The question is how accurate do you want your simulation to be? And that is the point that I was driving at earlier. As a CFD user, you need to understand where you can leverage accuracy for the sake of cost and vice versa. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm not uh, you know, looking to uh, verify R&D um, results. Right now, this is just a demo to show how to set this up. So I'm just working with a very simple mesh, but you can of course refine this further. So let's just start this. I will go with the outline view. Like I said, I prefer this over the ribbon stab. I'll go to the general section and this is an unsteady flow phenomena. So I'll select transient. And this is a 2D mesh, so planar will be selected. We are not considering any uh, gravity effects in here. I'll go to models. You can see in ANSYS Flow in 2020 R1, the default model is SSDK Omega. But like I said, this is a low Reynolds number flow. So this is a laminar flow. So I'll go ahead and select laminar in this dialog box and click OK. And uh, all these other physics, radiation, heat exchanger, species, discrete phase, uh, we are not concerned with that. So we are just going to keep this off and we will proceed to materials. Now we are just doing a fluid flow simulation and we're not really concerned with any solid materials over here. So I'm gonna expand fluid and go to air and double click on air. Now you have a fluent database from which you can select pre-existing materials both on the fluid uh, and the solid side. Uh, for the sake of simplification, I'm going to use a random fluid that I'm just gonna name fluid with a density of one and a viscosity of one. And the reason why I'm doing this is so that it's easy for me to specify the velocity at the inlet. Uh, I know my Reynolds number is rho Vd by mu. So if I have one and one assigned, it's easy for me to calculate the velocity. So I'm just gonna ran randomly assign one uh, density and one viscosity and then click change. So it'll ask me, do I want to override air? I say yes. So you'll see as soon as I change that, you know, the air switched out to fluid. Next, we go to the cell zone conditions. We have only one fluid domain over here. If I double click on this to ensure that the right material is selected, I can see that fluid is already populated in the field here. So I click okay. And that takes care of it. 
now we go to boundary conditions. So like I said uh, earlier, in the mesh, I had already assigned the name of the boundaries, the inlet, the outlet, the wall. So I can double click on inlet. And uh, right now it is um, assigned a velocity inlet type. So I'm going to assign a velocity of 80 meter per second. And this is just to make sure that the Reynolds number is between 80 to 100. So I think this is approximately the cylinder diameter is one. So I'm just gonna put 80 over here. You will see these additional tabs over here. They are grayed out right now because we are not including any of these other physics. It's a simple flow simulation. So we just have uh, one value to fill in. If for example, you wanted to change the type of this boundary, you could right click it, you could go to type and you could choose from any of these other boundary types. So for example, if you didn't know the velocity at the inlet, but you knew the pressure at the inlet, you could select the pressure inlet type and then assign the pressure at that boundary. Similarly for outlet, if I double click this, this has been assigned as a pressure outlet. And right now we are uh, going to look at zero gauge pressure and close this tab over here for wall. So by default, both the cylinder and these two edges have been defined as wall. So if I were to just show this. So what I did was I did a right click and I did a display. So it'll just show me which boundary am I looking at. If I want to add another boundary to the same graphics window, I'll go here and do add to graphics. And when I do this, so basically these two have been assigned walls as well, these two boundaries. But I'm actually gonna change this boundary type to symmetry. And uh, we will talk about, you know, symmetry boundary condition detail in a future video, but basically what it does is, you know, assigns two boundaries to have uh, symmetrical uh, conditions. So the only wall in this case is this circle over here, which is the outline of the cylinder. And this wall, if I double click on this, it is a no slip condition and a stationary wall. And the no slip condition is the most important condition as you all know uh, for wall, because that is what dictates uh, the nature of the flow for uh, these viscous simulations. So uh, we don't need to do anything else right now for the solution setup. All these options are not uh, relevant for this particular case right now, but we can discuss them in detail for other simulations in the future. Now we move on to the solutions tab. If we click on methods, it'll show you what options are selected by default for the pressure velocity coupling, the discretization, etc. Since this is a transient flow, I'm going to switch from the simple scheme to the piso scheme. Uh, the piso scheme is usually recommended for transient flows. It's supposed to take less iterations for convergence. Uh, but then again, right now, like I said, I'm not aiming for, you know, exactly accurate solutions. This is just, uh, you know, a simple demonstration of how we can set different things up. I'm also going to change the transient formulation from first order implicit to second order. Uh, second order is usually um, more accurate than first order. And because this is a very transient flow phenomena, uh, for the sake of extra accuracy, I selected second order implicit. We could go to controls. I'm not playing with the under relaxation factors here. But the under relaxation factors basically dictate what portion of your previous iteration has carried over to the next iteration. So again, this can be played with if you are trying to achieve convergence in an otherwise, um, you know, difficult to converge problem. Uh, report definitions. Suppose you want to calculate the lift coefficient on this uh, cylinder. You could do that. You could create a report for it. So you go to report definitions, you click new. You click on force report and you could go to lift. So we want to create a lift over the cylinder wall, right? We are clicking lift coefficient. Let me name this as CL. And uh, we will report the plot and we will also print the values to console. Keep in mind, this is going to be averaged over one time step. So we click okay. 
And the reason why I showed you this is the point of doing CFD is to be able to get your flow variables. So whatever flow variable you're monitoring, that should be easily um, uh, set up you know, in the report definitions. If I were looking at velocity at the inlet or pressure at the inlet, I could easily do that. And uh, yeah, so this is how I would set up the solution. Uh, I would go to initialization. I would select hybrid initialization. Um, we can talk a little bit about hybrid and standard initialization if anybody has questions. Uh, but this basically lets the solver guess your initial values for running the iteration process. And then we go to run calculation. And because this is a transient flow, here you would need to you know, spend some time to understand how much time do you want the solution to run for. So if I am running this for suppose 0 0.01 second in one time step, then I might want to put 250 time steps. That means 250 into 0 0.01, which is 2.5 seconds. So I'm basically asking my simulation to run for 2.5 seconds in real time. I might change this 20 to 40, uh, just to uh, make sure that at each time step, my simulation is converging. And then I'm gonna hit calculate. Now, I'm not going to um, calculate this now because it's obviously going to take time, but uh, I have solved the simulation already um, last night, and I'm gonna show you the results in that. So this way, you know, I conclude with the uh, solution setup and now we can move to the results section. So let me just go ahead and launch this over here. And tell me if you can see my screen now. Yeah, we can see your screen. Sneha, do you have an estimation of how long it took to solve? This did not take long. This took around, uh, uh, 30 minutes, 30 minutes to run. And that's because it's solving multiple times, right? It's solving yeah. for almost every iteration of the time multiple steps. Multiple time right? steps, exactly. So yeah. it also depends on how many time steps you're choosing or what time right. step size you're choosing. You don't want to, yeah. so there is an entire session to be had about how you choose your time step size, right? You don't right. want to choose a time step size that is too large so that you miss your time scales or you don't want to make it too small, you know, in the interest of uh, saving your computational resources. Uh, and you also have to make sure that, you know, you're meeting the stability condition. So, you know, there's something called the current number, which will help you uh, understand what sort of time step size do you need, right? So we can talk a little bit more in detail about those things um, in a separate AVA session, especially dedicated to transient flows. But these are the, you know, different inputs that you would need to set up that uh, flow simulation. So this was not, you know, this didn't take a lot of time at all. The only reason why it took a little bit extra time, again, was because I was doing the post-processing in ANSYS Fluent itself, just to, you know, let our users know that even though Fluent on its own is not touted to be a post-processing tool, but hey, I have used it on most occasions for looking at my flow variables. I can export the solution data to CFD post or to another visualization software like Insight. but even on its own Fluent is quite powerful. So the video that you saw that I'll be showing again, that was made in ANSYS Fluent. So I was able to you know, save the scenes, the animation scenes. So here, if I show you, um, if you look at the, results section over here, I had, I had created these simulation scenes and I had saved these simulation scenes at, um, you know, different time steps. And that is how I was able to generate that video. And all of that was done in ANSYS Fluent. I didn't need to step out. I didn't need to, you know, uh, go over to another platform. So ANSYS Fluent in itself is a very powerful visualization tool. Of course, if you need, um, you know, extra details on your um, visualization, then you might want to use uh, other ANSYS post-processing software, but Fluent will do the basic simulation stuff that you need to do. So right now, uh, let me go ahead and show this. So I have the contours of dynamic pressure showed here. So this is at the end of the time step. Um, 
this is after you know the solution reached convergence i could also show you the contours of velocity and you can see those vortices that i was talking about right so um you could also you know i i made this in a hurry but you could also um extend the domain a little bit more uh, in the you know wake region and uh, you know spend a little bit a computational mesh you know here uh, at the very beginning so this was just like you know uh, a very quick demonstration of setting up the cfd simulation and uh, i what i did was i saved um, so if i go to run calculation over here if i go to calculation activities i auto save the simulation after um, you know every four time steps so what that does is it allows you to go back and start your simulation not from the very beginning if you wanted to change something but you could use an intermediate time step as an initial solution for carrying out the simulation further so with transient flows you know you get a lot of different options to do your post processing you could look at your path lines as well so you can see the formation of vortices and um this is so if you look at the simulation over here this will go out in a loop you'll see how it starts off as somewhat steady and then eventually it just starts um vortex shedding which is primarily the von karman effect so even though this animation looks very difficult it was actually pretty easy to you know set up all i needed to do was um go to the uh solution animation and uh, click on any one of those contours we have a one of one of the someone had a question and they yes. and they wanted to visit the convergence monitor yes and have a, a little bit of discussion about that Go ahead. Yes, there, we we have one uh, in the Q and A. Somebody was asking yeah. about the convergence monitor. We can explain a little bit about that. Yeah. Like okay. I'll here. I'll I'll talk about that. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So basically, let me see. Can you see my presentation again, JD? Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. So. all in all you know i just want to go over the key takeaways before we jump onto the q and a session uh you know the first takeaway is cfd is a powerful design tool use it wherever you can whenever you're doing a fluid flow simulation to optimize and improve your product development you can reduce over engineering you can avoid failure modes you can start engaging in the design process earlier um uh, instead of you know waiting for something to you know fail or not meet the system requirements so cfd can be used as a very powerful tool and if you're not doing simulation already then you should seriously consider uh, you know taking that route it has been proven to be quite accurate uh, especially with the development of codes over the past few years um so if you pick up a verification and validation manual for ansys fluent you'll be able to see that the accuracy is comparable with what you would expect out of a test or an experiment um second thing ansys fluent uh, it covers a wide range of cfd applications and the ability to solve complex physics hence uh, i would doubt it to be the leader as far as cfd simulation solvers go uh, it delivers accurate robust solutions gives you the ability to uh, pair multi physics so if you were in the market looking for a cfd solver then ansys fluent would be the way to go and lastly uh, one important thing is uh, ansys fluent is very user friendly uh, one of the biggest usps of ansys fluent especially back in my day was that how it was easy to pick up compared to other commercial solvers out there uh, i mean you just saw i did an animation i did some post processing but even if nobody was there to you know talk me through it i could just click on the individual icons and it was pretty self explanatory and you know i'd get a uh, good visualization results even if i were not an expert so it looks complicated but it really isn't it's not that intimidating so if you feel like you know hey this is too complicated for me or i can't go that route uh you know we are here to help you uh, at kative 
And uh, I'm sure you know you have uh, a, a huge range of answers, documentation, and resources online as well uh, to help you in your CFD simulation journey. Um, with that said, I just want to um, remind everyone before you know I go into the Q and A session that these ANSYS Virtual Academy sessions are designed to act as your personal ANSYS knowledge base. Uh, use our sessions to help advance your simulation learning. Uh, these sessions will be held every other Tuesday at 10 a.m. PST uh, for um, almost an hour. Um, we will have the Q&A sessions towards the end of the webinars. Um, there'll be a reminder email that will be sent out before that week's topic. You'll be sent the link to join on Tuesday, one hour before the session begins. So with that, you know, we're gonna launch into the Q&A session. Someone has asked about uh, showing the convergence monitor. I can go back and show that real quick. Can you guys see my fluent screen? Yes. Okay. So if I go to the solution section over here, click on monitors and click on residuals. So when you're solving your simulation, so um, you can see these monitors over here. So right now in this particular simulation, you don't have a Z axis. This is a 2D simulation. So you see X velocity, Y velocity, and your continuity equation. Now the convergence criteria is set to be 0 0.001. You could make this 1E minus six. And what I'm basically saying is that the difference between two successive iterations the difference in those solution should be less than 1e minus six for me to assume that my simulation has converged. So for example, if uh, this was set to 1e minus three, then the difference between two successive iterations, the solution between two successive iterations, um, that would be less than uh, 1e minus three. So my solution would stop as soon as my residuals hit 1e minus four. So this is basically, you know, a way to ascertain what level of accuracy or what level of convergence do you expect out of your simulation. So this, these are just the convergence monitors. Uh, you can also, so when you set up something in report definition, support a flow variable. Uh, for example, I set up the lift coefficient right now in the active uh, fluent window that I had, uh, that will also show up as one of the monitors when you're solving. So you will actively be able to see how your uh, flow variables are changing over successive iterations. So that can be another criteria for you to judge whether your simulation has converged or not. If the value steady is out, it's not changing with iterations anymore, you know that, okay, this has steadied out, uh, time to stop the simulation. One important thing that I'd like to mention to anyone who is a new CFD beginner, just because you have a converged CFD solution doesn't mean that your solution is accurate. Solution converged just means that it's not varying anymore with successive iterations. Whether your solution is accurate or not, you need to uh, do an intuitive assessment. You need to compare it with experimental data. You need to compare it with tests uh, or analytical solutions to see that you're on the right track. And the next question a uh, one of our customers had, or one of our viewers, they wanted to know the difference between um, Fluent and CFX. Uh, you know, how does it read the mesh and what type of meshing capabilities do both programs have? So we will be, you know, doing separate sessions on CFX in the future as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But just, you know, in a very generalized way, uh, I, I'll just answer that question. Fluent is a multi-purpose, all-purpose generalized CFD, uh, you know, solver. CFX is more geared towards turbo machinery and rotating machinery. So you have automated functions inside, uh, you know, CFX that makes it easier for you to, you know, set up periodic simulations that you would see in rotating machinery. As far as the meshing goes, because CFX is mostly used for rotating machinery, the meshing uh, in those uh, components or in those applications is slightly different, uh, you know, from the kind that you'd use in ANSYS Fluent. You know, you'd use hexahedral block meshing for rotating machinery. So, like, there are a lot of differences that you know you could talk about, but essentially. 
the idea is that CFX is more geared towards turbo machinery applications and ANSYS Fluent is your uh, more general purpose uh, physics heavy, uh, you know, robust solver that will give you solutions for your, uh, uh, you know, standard CFD applications. Can, can both programs read mosaic meshes or is it only for, is it only for Fluent or CFX? I don't think that the mosaic meshing is uh, in CFX yet, but let me get back to you on that. I, I will have to double check, uh, you know, I, I, I'll have to double check on that. Uh, I, I, okay. I know it's definitely there in ANSYS Fluent, but uh, I don't think, you know, that's still an option for um, CFX. Okay. I think, um, yeah, I think that's it. If we didn't get to your questions, we're definitely going to keep in touch with you and contact you and we'll get those answered. Sure, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, I just want to thank everyone uh, for being a part of this first session. And I hope you found this session useful, especially if you're uh, looking to switch to CFD or, you know, starting to use ANSYS Fluent. Uh, be sure to, you know, um, tune in for John's uh, next session which will uh, be uh, alternate Tuesday, like every alternate Tuesday. So two weeks from now, not one week from now. <laughs> so. Thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye-bye.